Stonlearn, CEO of KNL2 Mining, listed on the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange. So we're a gold and copper mining company operating the Kanantu mine in Papua New Guinea, one of the highest grade mines in the world today, running over, over uh, 10 grams per tonne, averaged I think about 17 grams per tonne to date. Production last year, about 100,000 ounces gold equivalent. Um, guidance this year, 110 to about 130,000 ounces and growing. So during the last uh, 18 months, we've all been facing COVID uh, wherever you are in the world, no different than PNG. Been a few challenges for us, but despite that, we've commissioned our expansion, which moved us from 200,000 tons per annum to 400,000 tons per annum. That's reflected in our first half production uh, throughput, 40% up on the first half of uh, last year. Production ounces also significantly up. Busy looking at our stage three expansion, which is taking us to around 350,000 ounces a year by uh, 2025, commissioning uh, late 23, early 24. So looking at 250,000 ounces or thereabouts in 2024. So that's a three to four fold increase of where we were last year. To support that, we're busy with uh, exploration both surface and underground. We've just reported another 43 holes. And in those 43 holes, all diamond, all from underground, every single hole hit mineralization. 20% of them were over 20 gram per ton, 40% of them over 10 grams per ton. And I think 90% were over four grams per ton. And that's all on Cora. And that's our main focus right now although we've got a parallel vein system that we're busy with as well called Judd, and we're looking to bring that into production later this year. Supporting the expansion, we're busy with a twin incline, a brand new twin incline being developed. Uh, as of today, each of those two legs of the twin incline are about 450 meters in. So that's a five by five and a half and a six by six and a half supporting stage three expansion, which is to about 1.2 million tons per annum. But that twin incline will support up to 3 million tons per annum. So we're already looking beyond stage three to stage four. So we are high grade, growing production, expansion, self-funded. The money that we're making from the production we have right now, and we're one of the lowest cost producers in the world cash costs sub 600, all in sustaining uh, sub 700 long-term. So that expansion, self-funded, high grade, underground, that's us. John, good to have you back uh, here. Are you well? Are you in uh, Perth or are you up at uh, PNG? Right now I'm in Perth, um, going up to Diggers and Dealers Conference of in course. person in WA in Kalgoorlie uh, just over a week's time and immediately thereafter uh, up into PNG um, and uh, from PNG uh, I'll uh, probably head over to uh, to Canada where I haven't been for quite a while. PNG I've been getting into every quarter but Canada's been a bit longer something called COVID going around I believe. Well well, yeah so well, let's talk about that. Actually let me, let me make this statement to people. Uh, John and I had a conversation at the beginning of the year around social license, ESG, and I would recommend that people watch that as a kind of case study of how mining companies should operate in different jurisdictions. Okay, so we'll put the link to that below. So I wanted to get that out of the way. It's one of our most popular videos. Um, but let's let's talk about COVID impacts because you you know you're talking about guidance for this year, 110 to 135. Quite quite a, a range there. Is that what why? What's affecting your ability to be a little bit more precise with uh, what you hope to get this year? Is it down to COVID? In the main part, it's down to COVID. I mean, uh, we operate in PNG. Um, we employ about a thousand people. Um, less less than five percent, about four percent of our people are expats, primarily out of Australia, and the balance PNG nationals. 60% of those would be our local community people, that many of which had never worked in a mine before. So when you look at COVID, 
you're looking at not only a, a domestic situation, but you're looking at an international inter-border situation, travel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, many people are aware Australia's had a really good run in, ter- in COVID in terms of keeping an eye to the country. And that's great, but it gives you a challenge when you want to move people in and out to other countries. And so that's something we've had to manage. And, and I think we've done pretty well at, at managing it, the whole industry in PNG. Um, we operate a charter once a week from Australia to PNG and back, the whole industry. This is in agreement with the PNG government and the Australian government. We've got protocols in place to make sure that proper testing and everything else is being done. And the mine actually operates as a budget. Uh, budget, try that one again. <laughs> it, it operates as a bubble. So if you want to come onto the mine, you have to do a week of quarantine. Whether you come from Australia or whether you come from a village a kilometre down the road, it's a week of quarantine before you get onto site. And that week of quarantine, you get tested when you come into quarantine, PCR test, and then you get tested before you're allowed out and actually going into the workforce so that we make sure that, that we keep that, that bubble. Um, earlier in the year, we had suspension of, of FIFO for almost two months by the Australian government to make sure that everyone had their protocols in place. And they were very surprised to find just how stringent our protocols were. And so great support from the Australian government, great support from the PNG government, remembering that our industry is over 30% of the GDP of PNG and it's 85% of the export. So there's a lot of support there to, to make sure that the industry keeps going. But we've got to deliver as an industry, and so we have. Um, that, that gives you challenges and all the rest of it. You know, we, we run hundreds and hundreds of COVID tests every month. We're testing the workforce on an ongoing basis. We're testing people when they arrive to go into quarantine. We're testing them before they're allowed out of quarantine, et cetera, et cetera. We've provided um, monetary support to the local provincial governments and to the central government to help them combat COVID. We as a company and we as an industry were also helping with the rollout of vaccinations within PNG because you know that's that's part of what you need to do. It is a, 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 the health system there is limited, and we're we're part of it. We're, we're part of the country. We, um, yes, we're listed in Canada, but we also see ourselves as a PNG company, and the vast majority of people we employ are from PNG. So it's our country, our people, and uh, we try and make sure we can do the best we can for them. Okay, so John, I mean, that, that's it's obviously difficult times for everyone with, with, with COVID, but particularly with, with um, PNG, um, it's, you know, obviously, obviously it's a high, it's, it's really important for them that things are done the right way. It's really important for you that things are done the right way. Yes, we talked about, you know, early, earlier this year, but you've still got to deliver against guidance, right? You've got to, you've got to, you know, drive this company forward. You're $1.8 billion company now. So people are paying attention to you, but you've also got to keep delivering. It's, you've got a different set of problems, um, at, at this scale compounded by what COVID is uh, restricting you from doing. Are you going to be able to deliver to guidance this year? We certainly believe so. It, we'll be in the bottom end of guidance. We're not going to get the top end of guidance. It's, it's, it's been a really challenging year. Um, but yes, I mean, that's, uh, we haven't changed our guidance at this point in time, so we've, we've kept our guidance. Um, when you look at the second half of the year, you know, we've spent a lot of that first half of the year opening the line up. In terms of the, the plant and the expansion, that's gone incredibly well. Um, we've, we've had throughputs which are, which are almost 20% above on a daily basis, what that plant is supposed to be able to do. So in fact, from the plant perspective, we're actually now looking at expanding that plant to potentially 500,000 tonnes per annum instead of 400,000 tonnes per annum because the mill is, is still got spare capacity. And so, um, we've already ordered another crusher. We've already got on site another filter press or so a second filter press so that we can handle more concentrates. So plant-wise, really, really happy with what we've seen. The other side of the equation is, is ramp up your underground production. Underground production development meters were almost double from what we were achieving last year. So we've increased our development. We brought more stopes online. 
and we're obviously busy with the twin incline as well. So we got, we're opening up more and more areas, multiple areas underground, multiple stops underground. And remember, we're, we're mining two vein systems, K1 and K2. So we've got a twin vein system, multiple levels that we're mining. And right now, that resource covers an area of approximately a thousand meters by a thousand meters. So there's a there's quite a lot to to open up, thousand meters, thousand meters, double vein system. And hey, two hundred meters off to the uh, to the east, we've got Judd, new vein system, just uh, drilling. We've done three hundred meters of development along that, averaging three three and a half meters, ten grams per ton. This is something that has no resource yet and has only got about 16 holes in it. 300 meters of development averaged three to three and a half meters over 10 grams per ton. And, and that's like, that's something on the side uh, uh, that, we'll get, that we're getting into. In fact, we will produce from, from that our first stop by the end of the year. So a vein system that we hadn't drilled up until later last year and, and we got some pretty good intersections in it i have to say one of the best five in the world last year was in judd second half of this year we'll produce our first long haul stalk from it. so that's how quickly we we look to move and take something from having identified it to testing it to bring it into production. Okay, but okay, for the, again for the uninitiated because there are quite a few people coming into mining investment, especially precious metals. So the the introduction of this stope, or, you know, get, getting it, you know, delivering it ahead of schedule. Why is that important? Why should anyone care about that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it's pretty high grade. Um, uh, we we're averaging uh, this year. Um, probably around 12 grams per ton. And uh, the stop will certainly be higher than that. So um, it's a high grade stop, number one. Number two, this is a brand new deposit. So we're bringing a new deposit into production. Well, we've also got Cora, K1 and K2 in production. And remember, Cora is almost 4 million ounces of resource. Judd, parallel to it, is another deposit that we're bringing into production and that we're now drilling, and we'll have some drill results out on that later this month. We're now drilling to define a resource on that as well as the resource on K1 and K2, the Cora resource, which is the, which is the basis of our feasibility study to go to the 1.2 million tons per annum, 350,000 ounces. Judd is not in that right now. Judd will be in it, but it's not in it right now. So it's it's really important from the perspective also of generating information about mining techniques, geotechnical information, hydrological information, metallurgical information. We we have already taken a bulk sample out and we are taking material out and it's shown itself to be metallurgically very good, 90 odd percent recoveries on it high grade, obviously. And so this is the next step. Okay, so if I'm looking at your companies, I mentioned again, 1.8 billion Canadian dollars. It's a, it's a, it's a big company. You delivered 100,000 ounces last year. It's obviously high grade and therefore very high margin for you at, at 700 uh, bucks ASIC, right? So people can say, right, that's nice to do some nice simple maths. But if they do some comparisons to other companies producing 100,000 ounces, they're sitting at five, 600 million market cap. So people are buying into your potential. So I'm intrigued, I'm interested in how do you deliver that potential? You've got 60 million bucks in the bank. You continue to produce free cash flow. You are self-sustaining. What's the best allocation of that capital to deliver against this potential that you have and to you know hit this ultimately hit this 350,000 ounce number by 2025? How do you do it? Okay, well, I guess there's a couple of things. One, it's not ultimate. That's, that's a step along the road as far as we're concerned. When you look at Cora, right, we've drilled out 1,000 metres by 1,000 metres, as I mentioned. From surface, we know there's another 1,000 metres to the south. 
We haven't drilled it yet. Actually, we have drilled some of it from underground. We've actually started expanding our resource outside of our mining lease in our exploration area. So we've started expanding and, and some of those holes were reported, some very, very exciting intersections. So at depth, we don't know how deep it goes. Everything we've drilled to depth so far, we've hit the mineralization. So we don't know how deep it goes. So right now, this is what we've drilled. This is what we know. And we don't know going down that way. And that's Cora. Running parallel to it, we've got Judd. From surface, we know that Judd has a similar strike length, which is over two kilometers to Cora. And we know that we've got on the surface, we've had uh, three meters at 270 odd grams per ton, just uh, 100 meters below surface. And we know that where we are right now, which is 600 meters below surface, we've drilled, I think, five meters at 500 grams per ton. So we already know that we've got quite an extensive area that's got grade, and we're now starting to fill that in. So that's core Judd. Bring that to account. Well, the very first hole we drilled into Cora was in May 2017. We took out a bulk sample in October 2017, and we declared commercial production on Cora end of January 2018. May 2017, first hole drilled and discovered. January 2018, eight months later, seven months later, commercial production declared. Next stage, expansion. Delivered towards the end of last year, ramping up to that full production this year. The next phase, our belief was such that we started the twin incline last year because we knew that was going to be the lead item, the, the critical path to bringing this project in as quickly as possible to that next phase of expansion. We committed to it already. It's already underway, 450 meters in, being done by our own people. No contractors, we're doing it ourselves. Bought the equipment in. All brand new equipment that's being done, that's being used for that. Full-blown feasibility study um, will be completed in the first quarter and we'll immediately move to development. I mean, the, the numbers were just in the PEA that, that, that uh, was a precursor to this. Um, you know, you couldn't calculate the IRR unless you looked at it on a monthly basis because it's so good. And you're not borrowing money to do this. This is not a, okay, we're gonna have this DFS and then we'll take it to the banks and we'll talk to them very nicely. And they'll come along and say, yeah, we're going to lend you this money, but you're going to do this and this and this and this and this, and we'll be checking you and we'll be doing this and doing that. We're going to do it. We have delivered um, on two levels so far. We've now got our third level. But as I mentioned, in that twin incline, we're already thinking about not stage three, but what's stage four going to look like. Hence, the twin incline is designed to be able to go up to 3 million tons per annum because we think that it certainly has that potential. And I'd hate to be sitting here in three years' time and you're interviewing me and saying, listen, why have you interrupted production to make this, these twin inclines bigger? Why did you not think about that three years ago? Surely you knew something. And so I'd rather be sitting here in three years' time and you say to me, well, why did you make it so big? You're only up to 2 million tons per annum. I'll live with that. Well, I mean, don't, get, don't get me wrong. As a shareholder, I would be delighted if you're saying to me, we're self-funding going forward. We're producing enough cash to do the things that we think we need to do to extract the maximum value out of the ground here. So, I, you know, as a shareholder, fantastic. You're never going to tap me up for more money or the market up for more money. Brilliant. But I, I, I'm sort of intrigued as to how a company, when you reach a certain size, it's harder to kind of keep this growth story going. You're going to need to, as you say, I think you were targeting, targeting 500,000 ton per annum. You know, does that, how much money do you burn through? Because, you know, you're building up this free cash flow, free cash flow. Does it all go back in the ground? Or does it need to all go back in the ground? How quickly do we start seeing you building up cash piles? Well, during the development phase of this expansion, this stage three expansion, the, the projections right now at $1,500 an ounce so that we actually increase our cash position. 
Now, some of that will then go back into the ground in other exploration projects. Importantly for us, and this is really important for us, we just developed phase two and we're developing stage three and we're paying tax. We're paying tax in PNG. Um, last year, we were one of the highest taxpayers of the industry. This year, likewise, and our, our tax bill will go up this year. We're happy to say our tax bill will go up this year. Um, we've already paid our first tax installment in April. We'll pay the six ta second tax installment now. And I think we're looking at 30 odd million US dollars in tax this year. While we're spending $60 million in CapEx, 30 million expansion, 30 million sustaining. So while we're doing all that, we're also paying, paying tax. If you're paying tax, you're making money. This is a fundamental thing. You, know, if you make money, you pay tax, paying it in PNG. And so we're, we're projecting that, that we will actually be increasing the amount of, of, of cash that we've got. Um, and, you know, we're out there exploring in the rest of our ground. I mean, we've got over 700 square kilometers of ground surrounding the mine. Five exploration leases, we had two more uh, exploration leases uh, granted. And so we've got more areas that we'll be looking into. We're busy drilling at uh, Blue Lake, which is our porphyry target, and, and we'll have some results out on that by the end of the quarter. So you know, there's some, there's some, we think, some pretty exciting stuff going on in that area as well. So this is not just about high-grade vein systems. And remember, we are one of the highest-grade mines in the world, listed companies in the world. But it's also about a porphyry potential, and some of our shareholders are really excited by the porphyry potential that they see of, 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 the, um, of our exploration areas. So do you, okay, so 30 million expansion, 30 million sustaining, and there's a tax bill there as well. Do you finish this year even? I, do you finish this year with, with the cash, any cash to put towards next year, or is it just it's just con continually accumulating? Oh, look, we'll finish this year with about sixty or seventy million in, right, in, okay. in cash. Okay, and so it comes back to the point I'm trying, I'm trying to get to, which is, what does a company like you do? You've got a big land package. You're obviously in production already, and you're talking about the, the, the ways that you, you improve the efficiency and output from the mill, that's brilliant. You're good at exploration because the holes suggest that you, you know where the stuff is and the grades are great too. But it's almost like there's too much for you to do, or are you saying, actually, we're happy to do this, but this is a 20, 30 year um, operation here, or do you feel under any pressure from the market to say, I tell you what, we, we, we maybe need to maybe spin out a couple of things here and really get some, you know, immediate return for our shareholders in a different way. How, how, do, how do you come at it? Companies of your okay, size look, face I, different I, I problems. I don't think we need to, uh, I don't think we need to spin anything out, but look, if you don't feel pressure, to deliver to the market, you shouldn't be in the role. I mean, you, you should always be thinking that, yeah, look, I've, I've got to do something. I've, I've got to deliver. And I think that's important. You know, that's a driver for anyone, um, uh, whether you're a sports person or whether you're in business or whatever else, you've got to deliver. We have delivered, um, but we see ourselves continuing to deliver. Um, and that means, in our case, it means expansion, and that's expansion of production and it's expansion of resource. It means exploration. It means focusing on that organic growth that we've got, that potential we've got in Kenantu, and making sure that when we're telling people this is what we're going to do, we actually do it. If, if there's one thing that the market, I think, really appreciates about K92, it's that we've said we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we've done it. And, and I think the, the market rewards you. Uh, and, and, and that's not a criticism. Some people say, I'm going to do this and they're not doing it because there are a lot of reasons why you don't do it. Many, many reasons why you can't achieve. Um, but it's important to communicate with the market as well. Be clear on what your, your strategy is, what your goals are, what your targets and what you're going to achieve and communicate. And if you're not, something's not going to go quite right. You tell people as early as you can that, listen, X, Y, Z. I mean, we've had it with COVID. We, our last quarter wasn't our best. I mean, it was better than 12 months ago, 
but it wasn't what we were looking for. That was COVID. Did we make money? Yes. Did we make good money? Yes. Did we expand the amount of throughput we got? Yes, we did all those things. But for us, didn't quite get where we thought we should have been. And, and yes, there were mitigating circumstances and things that were way out of our control. But now we now work, okay, well, that's done. And we've, but now we're going to, how do we get that back? How do we go forward from that? So let's, let's talk about the market because the market can be a fickle thing, right? T -t -t Timing's everything. You know, some companies get marked down for being a single asset company or a single jurisdiction company. I mean, I don't think you're suffering from that. I mean, I think you have in the past, but um, I don't think you're suffering from that now. But do you think at some point that might be a concern? And this is why I'm asking about what do you do with your land packages? Because we've talked in the past about M&A, M&A, you know, multi-jurisdictional approach to things, multi-asset approach to things. Is that, or has that been part of any conversation or discussion about how you kind of make the, make the market feel a little bit more comfortable about, you know, who you are? Look, I think, uh, I think any company in our position would have to be looking at M&A, would have to be looking at opportunities. Um, the challenge for us, of course, is we've got one of the best assets in the world. So how do you get something that's accretive to your shareholders? And at the same time, if you're looking at something else, it's obviously going to have to be accretive to their shareholders. Otherwise, why would they want to do something? So... You've got challenges. We don't feel it's something we need to do, but we do believe that there is a potential to increase value to our shareholders by looking at the appropriate opportunities. And if you're not looking for opportunities, um, you're, not, you're doing a disservice to your shareholders. It's, it's, not, it's not about doing something. It's like a feasibility study. You know, There was a very large mining house at one point that had a really good team that did feasibility studies and their idea of a successful feasibility study was one that they then went and built and as a result they built a couple of dogs or cats i don't know if i'm allowed to say dogs and cats or oh, who knows because they they got it wrong feasibility study a good feasibility study gives you the correct answer and the correct answer may be don't build it now maybe build it later or don't build it at all because here are all your issues and in the same way, when you look at M&A, looking at something is good. But you look at it and you evaluate it and then say, well, yes, it works or no, it doesn't. So nothing, you know, it's, looking is good. Making a decision has got to be the right decision. And, and, and often people say M&A, yeah, right, I've, I've got to do something. No, M&A is about is there something that is the right thing for you as a company to do for your shareholders, for your shareholders. And that's important. And, and if it's an M&A thing and it's not a cash M&A thing, then your shareholders become a larger group of shareholders is going to be right for all of them. And, and, and to me, all of this has got to be driven by being able to create value, create value and be accretive in anything you do. Shareholders are looking for that. And, and, and that's also recognizing the market, as you said, and recognizing that you are in a single jurisdiction, that you are a single asset, and that you can improve a value by addressing those issues. You don't have to because you can, you can address it in other ways by making it um, something like uh, Freeport. You know, I mean, it's just, it was a single asset, but my gosh, what an asset. Not that I'm saying we're a free port. Like I, like I said, I don't think you're necessarily suffering from that problem, but it's, it's, I just wonder if it's part of the conversations because, you know, the mining industry generally is very good at forward planning. The engineers, they're looking at things and go, what, what if, what if scenario? So I don't think it's a problem, but I just wonder if it had been part of the conversation. But talking of feasibility studies, yours is due when? For Q1 next year? Are you on target for that? First quarter next year. Yeah. Right. Is that still on target? That was, uh, ideally, we were looking to finish it by the end of this year. Right. But with the COVID and all the rest of it, we have actually pushed it out to first quarter. Yeah. Okay. So it's already and, factored in a delay. Okay. Yep. And in addition to that, we'll also be doing a PEA looking at what is the, what's the, 
what's the vision going forward given okay. the resource that we have because the dfs remember will only be measured and indicated and of course we've got a lot of inferred so we've got to look at what is that picture going to be going forward so that we can keep the market and our shareholders informed of where we think we're going. Well, the PEA interests me, I think, more than the fit because you've done already a lot of work on the measured and indicated, and we, we can see the, the the potential for that. But the PEA, what, what exactly are you trying to bring together? Well, first off, we'll be bringing in, we'll already have, uh, as a PEA, we'll already have a lot of very good cost information, which comes from the DFS, and we'll be looking at the, the size of the plant that we have. Um, but then we're looking at, okay, and that's, so now with all this inferred, as that, as that comes in, how does that project look? Do we, for instance, now look at another phase of expansion? Do we look at the existing plant being brought back into production as you expand production going forward? Or do you just run the project for 20 years or whatever the number is for a longer period of time? So, so you're looking at, at those scenarios within the context of an existing resource still. You know, you're not looking beyond what you've got as a resource in a measured indicated and inferred. So it's not the blue sky, if you like. It's still very much anchored on a resource as a PEA must be. Right, okay. I'd say, when, when can we expect to see that the PEA or at least you know, some of the findings from the PEA? Same sort of time as the DFS. Okay, fantastic. I think that's the exciting bit for me. It's just about how you bring it, because you've got a lot of moving parts and obviously the new data coming through with the drilling all the time. Um, th that'll be interesting. So right around Q1 next year. Um, and, and, and there's, what, are we still heading for a resource update at the end of this year then? Or has that been moved? Correct. Right. Okay. Right. And what's yep. that going to tell us? What's it going to tell you, more importantly? Well, the target there, first of all, is to increase our measure and indicate it. Obviously, because we, you know, the, the previous resource is 1.1 million ounces of measured and indicated 3.7 million inferred. We need to take that measured and indicated to 2 million ounces in order to fit into the feasibility study. So it's about bringing that measured and indicated up. And that's why a lot of our drilling is infill drilling. But it's also about an expansion of the overall resource. We've been pushing further to the south. We're not trying to push any deeper at this point in time, because from where we are underground, that's quite difficult to do. We've got a twin incline coming in. When that twin incline comes through, then of course we'll have a deeper platform. That twin incline will come in about 300, 300 meters below the existing incline. So we'll, be, we'll have a platform which will be 300 meters below where we are now, and that will then be looking to push the resource deeper. But that's not going to happen until towards the end of next year when it comes in. Right. Okay. So you talked about uh, earlier about 43 drill holes, all high grade stuff. Uh, have you got any more drills outstanding sitting, waiting to come in? Ooh, we've got about 40. Okay. So quite a bit. Um, right. We've got uh, uh, for coral. Um, and that's because, again, with the COVID situation, we kept the drills going because we reduced our numbers. We kept the drills going as much as possible but we reduced the number of uh, people we had on site so that the, the processing of core, the logging and processing of core was held up. Now we're on catch up mode. That'll take us until the end of this quarter to catch all of that up because of course we're generating, generating holes, you know, multiple holes weekly. How, how many drills have you got going? Did you, did you say? We've got four on the surface and we've got another uh, five underground. Right, okay. Okay, wow. And, and you're happy with that? You're not looking to increase that at all? It's a lot of drills. Look, we're, we're, we're always looking at, uh, at, at those sort of things. And, and uh, certainly I would expect next year we will have underground, we'll have more rigs than that because we'll have more areas open. Because remember, it's, it's, again, you, you come down to your infrastructure, your ventilation, your power, et cetera, et cetera. There's, an in, you know, there's only so many rigs we can put underground. But uh, yes, we want to increase the number of rigs that we've got underground. Yeah. So that is in the plan. But you're, you're, you're balancing out wanting to know more, wanting to develop out more to the south, because we've now developed out beyond our mining lease. We're now going into our exploration ground and we're setting up to drill from underground in our exploration ground. 
So you're balancing that out with obviously ramping up your production and setting yourself up for the next phase of expansion. So it's it's a constant balancing act and increasing ventilation, increasing power, um, reticulation underground, skilling up your workforce, increasing your um, your mobile fleet. How do, how does a a company like a how does a major how does a BHP how does a Rio operate in a com- country like PNG? Well, BHP are not in uh, in uh, PNG anymore. Uh, Rio Tinto, I think, have got some exploration grants. And Newcrest are obviously de- uh, are developing the Wafi Gold Pool uh, as a joint venture with Harmony. Um, and uh, Harmony operate the Hidden Valley. Uh, we've got St. Barbara operating uh, St. Barry. Um, and uh, Barrick, I guess, are the, are the big major in there with Porger, which, as you know, has been closed for some time, but that's reopening. I think uh, I think Mark Bristow. I, I met with Mark in February in PNG. We were both in PNG at the same time, and I think he's I think he's in there now, or he's just been in there. I can't remember one or the other. So, um, they how do they operate? Um, well, what do, I guess the question is: Do they have to change the way they behave in a country like PNG to be able to operate successfully to have? The relationships that they're going, they they need to have. I, I think you have to you have to change how you operate wherever you go in the world. You you have to operate to the conditions to the culture of that country. Um, PNG, for instance, where we we try and minimise our expat. We're the lowest in the country in terms of the resource industry. We, we, we have four point something percent of our workforce is our expats. That's important because people in PNG want to see that, that you are committed to developing skills, knowledge, experience, and everything else in PNG so that there are opportunities for them. And that's a big focus for us. Uh, we're a big sponsor of the, of the university. Um, we've got over 50 uh, scholarships for our community kids to go to higher, to go to uh, uh, university and colleges. So for us, it's a big focus, um, but culturally different. Um, some places, for instance, you, you can't work 12 hour shifts. So you might not be working 12-hour shifts, you might be doing eight-hour shifts. Um, you've got to look at uh, um, a lot of other issues that, that come through, such as religion. It sounds like, what's religion got to do with anything? Well, um, a lot of people in PNG are, are Seventh-day Adventists. Saturday is the Sabbath, not Sunday. And so that's something else you've got to bring into your equation of how people, uh, how people work, what they're, what they're looking to do. What drives people? Land is incredibly important in PNG. It is fundamental to life. Land, family, clan, tribe. Um, when you think about PNG, two hundred odd thousand taxpayers out of a population approaching nine million. So it tells you the vast majority of people are subsistence farmers, and so land is a single most important thing in PNG. And so when you're, when you're there, wherever you are, you're on somebody's land. It doesn't matter where you are. You're on somebody's land. And you've got to deal with that. And if you're not delivering something to them, it doesn't matter what the government say and what they give you as a lease. If you are not delivering to that family, that clan, that tribe, why should you be on their land? What you know, you're you're taking up some of their land that they could be farming, and what are they getting in return? So, it, it's really important to to recognise those sort of cultural issues and and you know, tribe PNG as Australia is different from one part of Africa to another part of Africa, or to my hometown of my home country of Scotland, you know, where we don't have clans. Well, actually we have clans, not tribes, you know. So, although we've lost a lot of that. But it, those things, 
different drivers and you, and you and you've got to deal with it differently. Um, consensus is really important in PNG, whereas it's not necessarily in parts of Africa where it's more hierarchical, if you like, in terms of, you know, there's the tribal chief and when he goes, his son gets a job or whatever. Yes, you have a government, but you also have that. PNG, you have the government. You also have the leaders of, of uh, tribes, clans. Not hereditary, it's about who who is seen as the most appropriate and more consensus driven. It's a, it's a view and that's very similar to Aboriginal culture, for instance, in Australia, where it's a consensus. It's not about, you know, the, the tribal leader says, this is how it's going to be, because there isn't. It's about elders coming together and, and making decisions. And, and yeah, all the, those things are changing, but they're still very much there. So you've got to recognize all those things in, in, in the different countries that you go into. And, and what are the outcomes that people are after? Yeah, well, I'd like yeah, I, I could talk about that with you all day because I think it's truly really, really fascinating and obviously hugely important that people do understand what they're walking into. And I just I was again trying to understand how different companies approach this uh, is it's is kind of it's important to me as part of the investing thesis. But talking of investing, look, we one we're sort of running out of time here, but two is what would you say to new investors? Looking at K nine K ninety two as a possible investment because you know large companies typically don't have the leverage that some investors are looking for. What? Why do you think they should be looking at you guys? Self funded growth. You know, the in looking at the um, junior mid tier time, you're and especially when you're looking at companies, um, relatively small companies that have got. Um, very significant, we would say, a, a tier one type asset is, first of all, in order to develop that asset, the company has to generate money. It has to raise money. And so you're looking at dilution for shareholders. And and that's not a criticism of companies. That's simply reality. You, if you haven't got production, you haven't got revenue coming in, but you need that money to be able to to be able to bring the value of your asset to account. We don't have that issue because we are a producer, a low cost producer, and we're generating cash that enables us to do our expansions and to bring the value of the asset to the table. So you're not getting dilution, but you have got growth. We've got growth outlines for the next few years and the massive potential beyond there. We have a team that's proven they can do that. Not only find, and remember that our, our Cora, Cora North was um, PDAC Discovery of the Year this year. We were awarded the Fair Lindsay Award. So we, we've shown that we can not only find something that a major who'd owned the mine before did not, but that we can bring it to account, we can bring it into production very quickly. And we can operate in the country. Um, we have, uh, we think, an extremely good relationship with government. We've been lauded by government um, uh, recognition, not only for things like the discovery of Coral North, but as a, a major taxpayer in the country. And so we've, we've, we think we've shown from community to government, discovery, production, growth, all of those things we bring to the table. And that sounds like that's a recipe for success and therefore everyone should have it. It is a recipe for success. Um, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Um, and there are a lot who are doing it, by the way, and, and doing it very, very well. And I'm personally invested in many of them. Um, but my biggest investment is in K92 because I think that's the best investment I've got. 